that matter. That's why if you're, not if you're not born with autism or some kind of mental incapacity, God loved those people. But they have a disprivilege. They don't, they don't have the ability to learn of God the way we do. So God loves on them special in a different way because of that. He loves them even more so because of that. And so he gives uh, them a special love we'll never understand. But for those who have the ability to learn and understand, don't sell that short. Don't, don't, don't take it for granted. Because the Bible is not an emotional first book. It's a knowledge first book. It's about the relationship, which emotions tied into it, but the deepened understanding of who the person is, and you put the emotion into it, now the deeper the relationship becomes and the appreciation and gratitude is even more anchored in truth and the foundation of elements that you understand about who that person is. So the emotions are secondary to the knowledge of that person, which is primary. Because again, if that were not the case, why was Lazarus not front and center, euphorically shouting from the, screen in the, from the mountaintop, oh, I know what happened, oh, I know, I know what's going on right now. Because I, I would have been that way. So were you. If you were just there two weeks ago, and you came back from the dead, and then Jesus just went there, you're like, dude, I'm sad too, but let me tell you, he said, I heard him, he said paradise, and um, I was there. So, so what's his, what's happened? Abraham's taking control of stuff and everything, and Moses is there, and Joshua, and he's talking to Esther, and then on the corner, it was like Deborah was there, and then Rachel and Rebecca and stuff, and it was really cool stuff, man. And then Solomon was like, oh, yeah, yeah. it was really cool, you should see it. I mean, they're like, what? what? He's like, I was there four days, you know? Four days, I was there four days. I know what's going on, I was there for four days. But not one time did you see him talking about that. But you can't tell me that those conversations probably weren't happening. But what did the Bible do? What did God do? Voice on the commentary of that happening. Why? Because we'd have so we, we, we would got enamored into the emotion of it all. We'd have gotten into, hoo, 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 that's exciting, hoo, that's most fun, it must have been fun. That's, what, that, that's, it, that's true, yeah, but it's not the point. The point was what Jesus said, oh, inconsiderate, oh, thoughtless, mindless people, don't be slow of heart. That's the lesson. That's the lesson. I know you're traumatized, I know you're depressed, I know you're anguished, I know you're confused, but go back to the word of God as your peace, go back to the word of God as your anchor, because through the written word of God, you will experience the living word of God. And you said, that's just me saying that. The road to Emmaus is validation of that. He taught them the word of God that led to him, the living word of God, and then they go, <gasps> case in point. The road to Emmaus proves that very principle is true. The written word of God leads you to a deepened relationship of understanding of the living word of God. I didn't make this stuff up. So the resurrection, yes, is a euphoric emotional day, but it's even more emotional and euphoric when you have an understanding of the written word of God. It's euphoric and emotional just as it is, but it's even deeper when you find out more about who God is, how much he loves you and me, and what he went through in the death. So it's a lot, because not just what he went through, but who would happen to. So both of those fashions build and deepen your relationship of this emotional euphoric day. Because of who would happen to the 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 righteous one, the un, he didn't deserve any of that stuff, and then all the the heinous things that happened to him, the betrayal, the the hurt, the mental, the physical anguish, just tr tremendous. But he's risen again, and he's alive. So he's risen, and I can't even <laughs> I can't imagine Peter again uh, being euphoric. I, I I can't imagine those days after that, those couple weeks after that, when they were interacting with Jesus because he was here still on the earth. How were those conversations? Were they, were they like, Peter, let me tell you about what happened? Or was it more like, I can't believe it's all alive. I can't believe it. I, this is real. I can't believe it. And you forgive me. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. I can't believe it. And he, they're like, calm down, Peter. Calm down. How can he not just get over that? How, you just don't get over. You can't get over a loss? Yeah. You can't get over also betraying Jesus such a way where it hurt you so badly. You wept bitterly. You hated yourself. Almost at the same cusp that your brother took his life, you were close to doing the same thing, and now he's saying, I forgive you. And you realize, he forgave Judas too? Yes. Yes. He's like, he just didn't realize it. I, I got to realize my forgiveness, but he realizes his later. And he's like, I couldn't believe this, man. This is crazy. How could that not be constantly in his head? Then you wonder why in Acts, he just, first thing he's out of his mouth is about Judas, by the way. What a coincidence. Because it was affecting him more than any other disciple. But also, he goes into this, the, the, this, 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 this courage and faith to this talk. Because I, I can't imagine the emotional relevance to how the understanding of God's word tied into that and how it changed his life. So they both are true. You need the emotion euphoria of joy of God's word, but you need to have the knowledge of what God's word says and who he is. And when you put them together, whoo, just see Peter in the book of Acts, you'll see a different man, a different human. He is so excited. He is so relentless and so, like, convicted. And he says... One of his best phrases I'm with, he says to the Caiaphas Sanhedrin, what would you rather me do? 
obey man or obey God? I'm going to trust in God. God you, can't, you can't threaten me or scare me. And he just had been put in jail. Jail opened up. He walked right out. He's like, <laughs> whatever. And Jesus told him, though, remember, Jesus also told him, you will have experience of death just like me, but not yet, being crucified upside down, of course. But he wasn't even afraid because he knew he was going to die the same. He knew he was going to honor his Lord by dying a similar death to him. So in his life, he's, his, his mind, he's like, God already told me my end's coming, so I'm just going to embrace the point from now to then. I'm not going to make that mistake before and lose moments of my emotional depression by missing opportunities to embrace his joy, his love, his restoration, his peace, and how he changed my life because both those things work together. It takes time, and that's why I think Jesus put that 50 days in there. It doesn't happen overnight. It takes time to get adjusted, and it took Peter all that time, and then we see a different Peter. So amazing thing. So Resurrection Sunday, he is risen. We serve a God that in the body and person of Jesus Christ is not dead. He lived, he died, and he is risen from the dead. He's the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. And he has the, the keys of death, hell, and the grave, or Hades and the grave. So he is victorious. And so yet he died and yet he lives. You also will die and yet live. And we all will always be with the Lord. As he says, absent from the body is present with the Lord. And so we always be with him. So it depends on what extent we want to be with him and how we want to inter interact with him and his, jo his joy and his love and his peace. We experience more of him now and more of him later. Let's close in prayer to honor our communion for this Sunday. So, Father, we thank you for this communion day, this Sunday, this Resurrection Sunday, your joy, your peace, and your confirmation that you validated everything that you said you would do by going through such a gruesome, awful time. But thank you for reminding us that through this trauma and sadness, without it, we wouldn't have the greatest joy and rejoicing and peace and your love known to us. We wouldn't know the depth of your love until you went to such a depth of despair of, of such hardship. So we thank you for helping us get through times where we have to learn to adjust, not only to understand how to get through our own pains, but to ask you to help us forgive ourselves, to help you, uh, help us to remind us through what we need to ask for forgiveness for. And But thank you above all that you never forsake us, that you draw closer to us in times of trouble, that you hold us even more dear in times of our need. And we thank you that you love us more than anyone ever could. And we thank you loved us so much you endured such a painful, agonizing death but you gave us such a joyful moment that validates everything you said, everything you told us through the prophets, everything you laid forth then and, and still yet forth to happen has all been validated by this memory of this day 2,000 years ago, that you are alive, that we serve a risen Savior, that you are risen, and you are everything you say and then some. You are the living word, testified of the written word, and you are God Almighty, holy, holy, holy. So we thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you've done and continue to do in giving us sanctification, reconciliation, and deliverance from sin. Give us your peace and your love and have us remember this time of your last supper as we do this time of commemoration of you on this holy and blessed Resurrection Sunday, on this Easter Sunday. In Jesus, this year's name, amen. Sorry for the long-winded prayer. I know I talk fast. I was kind of excited.